Would you open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Mark that with one finger, and in just a few moments, we're going to be looking at John chapter 1. So you might mark Luke 2, and then in a few moments, John chapter 1. If your Bible is an iPhone, I do not know how to do that. But we'll figure that out. Luke chapter 2, we'll be turning to in just a moment. Let's pray together. Have mercy, please, O Lord, upon the one who speaks, for his sins are many. May we see Christ, and just Christ. Amen. So there you are in Macy's department store. The place is packed with people who had the same idea that you did, and that is to take advantage of a Saturday to get your Christmas shopping done early. But you're making good progress in spite of the crowd. You've already found the fleece for your son and the, and the perfume for your niece. And you're inching your way into the jewelry department to look for those little pendants that your mom keeps talking about. When all of a sudden, the Macy's department store just explodes in music. I'm not talking about somebody humming Silent Night behind you. I'm talking about an explosion of Handel's Messiah, not through the speakers, but through the shoppers. The guy to your right who is just pushing the baby stroller stops and he belts out the tenor part. And the ladies to your left who were looking for pajamas, carrying shopping bags, don't even set the bags down before they turn and they begin to sing toward the mezzanine. The place is full of music. And all of the store can be divided into two groups. Those who are singing and those who are wondering what in the world is happening. Can you imagine such a scene? In case you cannot, turn your attention to the screen for a minute. What a moment. Shoppers became worshipers. 
Macy's became a sanctuary and a common, normal Saturday became a Christmas celebration. But what happened in Macy's last October is nothing. I'm talking small potatoes compared to what happened in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. Here's how Luke described it, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, and that all the world should be registered. This census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and of the lineage of David to be registered with Mary his betrothed wife who was with child so it was that while they were there the days were completed for her to be delivered and she brought forth her firstborn son wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Now we know what happens next. We know about the shepherds and the angels. We know about the bright star and the arriving dignitaries, the wise men. But did you notice before any of that happens, the whole story of the birth of Jesus just drips with normalcy. I mean, it could be shopping day at Macy's. It was just a normal, normal setting. A regular couple, Mary and Joseph, covered with road dust, arrive in a simple town of Bethlehem, facing the common problems, a government census, a crowded hotel, no place to stay, and finally they end up in a common stable. The story of the birth of Jesus begins in such commonness. This isn't King Joseph. This isn't Queen Mary. They don't have a tax exemption. They, they don't get special dispensation from the government to stay home. Yes, God is within her belly, but she receives no special permission. She's so normal. Joseph is so normal. This isn't Joseph and Mary of the Bible. This is Norm and Norma of normal Nazareth. They're just normal. Normal has calluses like Joseph on his hands. Norma has stretch marks like Mary. They're just normal. They don't have a caravan to take them. They don't have banners. They don't have servants. They're just normal. Normal like you. Normal like me. Norma sings off key. Normal has to get work get to work early in the morning. Norma has more than she can do. All the laundry's piling up. Normal has a cranky boss who wants him to take one more trip before Christmas. Norm and Norma have learned the life of being normal. Consequently, they don't receive a lot of special exemption, special treatment. They've even heard what Joseph and Mary heard when they arrived at the inn. You know, we're just a little crowded. Uh, we don't have room for you. Had that been King Joseph and Queen Mary, they might have heard a different response. And maybe you've heard that statement too. We don't have room for you. We don't have time for you. We don't have a job for you. We don't have an opportunity for you. We don't have space for you. And behind those words is the understanding because you're so normal. It's just normal. You indwell that common populace between rube and royalty. Just common. That's why we love this story. 
Because if Jesus chose a normal setting and normal people through which to be born, dare we might, dare we assume, dare we dream that he might do it again. You see, what if Jesus had in the womb of Joseph and, I'm sorry, in the womb of Mary. <laughs> I know that much. What if Jesus in the womb of Mary had shown up with a bunch of pomp and circumstance? What if Joseph and Mary had been wearing furs and riding in a limousine, a bunch of bling bling and and, and, and muckety-muck and, 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 and celebration. What if God had turned Bethlehem into something that looked like Hollywood on Oscars night? And Joseph and Mary had, had arrived on a red carpet. And all of the angels had come and stepped down to interview Mary as she walked into Bethlehem. And they all said, oh Mary, Mary, you look just simply divine. That was a joke divine <laughs> had Jesus arrived encircled in pomp and circumstance we would be reading his story thinking my what a wonderful way God entered the world but since Jesus chose to enter the world cloaked in commonness we commoners can read the story and think my might he be willing to do it again through us and in us just common folk sometimes I think that the real splendor of Christmas is the lack thereof. John, when he describes the coming of Christ, comes at it from a different angle. Luke takes us ground level. We follow Joseph and Mary into Bethlehem. John, on the other hand, takes us up to heaven. And with the pen of a poet... He begins in John chapter 1 to describe the coming of Christ. I'm reading in verses 1 through 3 of John 1. And then I'm going to jump down to verse 14. He says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And all things were made through Him. And without Him, nothing was made that was made. And then verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. How does John begin his gospel? The same way the author of Genesis began the Bible. Have you ever noticed? In the beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Is this a coincidence? Or is this John's intended message? In the beginning, in the beginning, the one who Mary held, the babe in Mary's arms, the baby in the manger, was in the beginning. He was in the beginning. In the beginning was Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. And then verse 3 he says, All things were made through Him. All things were made through Him. No, not by Him. Did you notice? There's a difference. If all things were made by Him, then He would take things and assemble them, pre-existent things, assemble them into something. No, all things were made through Him, which suggests He took nothing and made it into something. He became the very force in which things began to exist. He didn't just reassemble that which existed. He, by divine fiat, called into existence something out of nothing. 
In the beginning was the Word. This Jesus was in the beginning. And all things were made through him. He was, we might call him the Genesis Word. Paul said he was the firstborn over all creation. Paul said he's the one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom God made everything and through whom we have been given life. So here's the picture of Jesus, the one who was in the beginning, the one through whom everything was made. And then John says, that word became flesh. He became one of us. What no theologian could imagine, what no rabbi ever dreamed, Jesus did. God became flesh and he dwelt among us. He became Emmanuel. God with us. Remember the promise of the angel? Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. And they shall call his name, what? Emmanuel. Which is translated, God with us. Imanu in Hebrew means with us. El, E-L, is abbreviated form of Elohim. The name for a name for God. So Jesus comes as the with us God. Emmanuel, the with us God. Not the near us God or the around us God or somewhere in the zip code God, but the with us God. The artist became a paint drop on his own canvas. The potter became mud on his own wheel. God became a fetus and placed himself in the most normal of circumstances, in the womb of a girl, covered himself in placenta and descended through the birth canal into the calloused hands of a Jewish carpenter. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? Because if God would become flesh and dwell among them and be the Emmanuel, we can believe that God is with us even now. And that not for a moment, not for a moment, dare you think that you are too normal, too ordinary, too common to miss out on the presence of God. And that God has not chosen to limit His presence to sanctuaries and saints that are in a stained glass window. But that God has chosen to come among the normal people who are just crazy enough to believe He will normal I don't think Joseph and Mary had the advantage that we parents have today and that is the advantage of ultrasound technology but many parents today including Deanland and me when our three daughters were born we wanted to get a advanced glimpse of our child and so we had an ultrasound taken. You know what that is? They get a picture of the baby. It's, it's not much of a picture, but you know, there's no waving and no smiling. It looks more like a Doppler radar storm forecast, which it may be. <laughs> and if in, at least we had to have somebody it's probably better now this was years ago it's the first two daughters born in Brazil we had to have the doctor help us out and look at the picture and uh, you know get the interpretation and he, he started pointing things out he said well there's a leg and oh there's another leg and there's a hand and, and there's a pierced nose and th- oh no that was a later photo sorry <laughs> getting them confused <laughs> But the words we wanted to hear were the words he said at the end. He backed away from the picture and he said, Well, everything looks 
said the same thing to you? Normal. It looks normal. Allow this to hit you for just a moment. Had Joseph and Mary had an ultrasound conducted on Jesus, the Son of God, the doctor would have looked at everything and said, hmm, head, torso, legs, hand. well, looks normal. Normal. A normal baby is going to be born. But you will call him Emmanuel. Because wrapped in the cloak of commonness is God. And God is with us. He loves to come to normal people. He loves to come through normal circumstances. In fact, I dare say, if you will listen, you'll begin to hear the music around you of the with us God. Why would He do this? The only reason that makes sense to me is this one. And that is, He must really think highly of you. He must think you're something special. I mean, he must really be fond of you. If he, if he is so willing to come into your world, to talk to you, to be with you, to dress like you, to appear like you, to become flesh, so that someday you can go into his world, he must really think highly of you. Have you ever thought about what that journey was like for God to become flesh? I know John reduces it down to a sentence. He says that the Word became flesh, but that is an immense journey, isn't it? What would that be like for the God of creation to become a resident of Nazareth in a carpenter's home? On the, on the campus of the Crown Ridge, on the Crown Ridge campus of the Oak Hills Church. If you notice, you might see some black-tailed squirrels. There are quite a few families of them around here. So many that sometimes we include them in our weekend attendance figures. <laughs> when my office was on this campus, I made good friends with a family of black-tailed squirrels because right outside my office window they occupied I guess they still do uh, they occupied a tree they made a home out of a tree and I could anytime I looked out my window it seemed there they were up and down that tree up and down that tree out and about in and out up and around that tree I really liked those squirrels we became good friends some days I watched them all day long. I didn't do any work. I just sat there and I just watched the squirrels up and down. One day I think one of them winked at me. I winked back. We hadn't pet names for each other. It was a very kind and cordial relationship. We were good neighbors. But never once, and you're going to find this hard to believe, but never once did I consider or wish that I could become a squirrel. I really liked them. But never once did I offer a prayer, God, make me a squirrel. Give me a long black furry tail. Make me little with tiny sharp teeth and claws. I never once prayed that. You know why? Because I saw what squirrels ate. <laughs> Do you know what squirrels eat? Squirrels never go to Whataburger. Squirrels never have steak. Squirrels don't know what bluebell ice cream is. They eat these dirty, yucky nuts. And that's all they eat. It's, it's, it's pathetic. And do you know where squirrels live? They live in a hole in the tree. You think I'm going to give up what we get to live in for their world? 
You think for a second I'd give up the Texas sky or the Texas prairie or I'd give up a chance to see Grand Canyon or the Pacific Ocean and confine my life to just a little hole in a tree? Heaven forbid. And, and they don't know, they think the whole world is just about 500 square yards between a parking lot and a sidewalk. They never go beyond that. I would ask them, go venture out in life. Explore things. See the world. And they look at me with these beady eyes like there's no other world. I don't want to become a squirrel. And how far of a journey would that be for me to become one of them? As soon as you find an answer to that question, multiply it by about a billion, and you'll have a fraction of what it meant for the Lord Jesus to become flesh and dwell among us. For he who was never bound by time to suddenly live in a world that is marked by time. For he who could be anywhere at any time to voluntarily reduce himself for 33 years to as far as his feet would go. For he who is never tired to fall asleep. He who is never hungry to look for something to eat. To feel everything that you and I would feel. So that we would believe that he really is Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. God is with us. I'm not sure you're believing me. God is with us. He's with you in your sickness. He's with you in your finances. He's with you in your fears. And on those nights that you awaken and your heart is beating from some indiscernible fear, God is with you. And on those days that you're frustrated by the traffic or aggravated by the boss, God is with you. He is with you. The one who made the stars is with you. God is with you. You know what that is? That is present tense, isn't it? Not God was with you, or God will be with you, or God could be with you, or God would have been with you if. But God is with you. That's called present tense. That means God is present, so don't be tense. You can relax. God is with you, beside you, ahead of you, behind you, above you. Next week, I'll show you how God is in you. God is in you. So are you normal? Congratulations. God comes to the, to the world through people like you. And if you'll listen carefully, even in the most normal of moments, listen carefully, you might hear the music. And this God with us God wants to talk to us. And he wants